All right, hello and welcome to the latest uh, webinar in the Crow Fall series, uh, looking at economic issues in the 2020 election and beyond. My name is Noah Williams. I'm the director of Crow, the Center for Research on the Wisconsin Economy, which we started here at UW-Madison in the Econ Department in the fall of 2017. Our focus is on state level economic issues and economic policy. But because Wisconsin played such a crucial role in the 2016 election and as well uh, is looking to be uh, quite influential in 2020, we thought we would broaden out and look at some of the national uh, factors, uh, including uh, economic issues involved in 2020. So we've had two uh, issue, two webinars on background issues, looking at uh, fiscal policy as well as a, a number of other economic factors going into 2020. And then today we're going to be speaking with Casey Mulligan, who will be discussing economic policy in the Trump administration. And then next week on Wednesday, uh, we'll be talking with Alan Blinder, who is at Princeton University and served on President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors, as well as Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve. And he'll be talking about uh, the economy in 2020 and prospects for a Biden administration. I want to encourage any, everyone uh, as we go along um, to an, uh, input any questions you have in the online chat feature. Uh, my colleagues and I will be reading them out and we'll uh, you know, have uh, in the interaction that way. As well, I encourage anyone who's able and interested to stick around afterward. We'll, have, we'll shut the recording off, have a little bit more informal session uh, in some smaller groups where you know, people can turn on uh, their cameras and audio and uh, speak directly with each other and with the speaker. And with that, let me introduce our speaker for this evening. Casey Mulligan is a professor at the Kenneth C. Griffin Department of Economics at the University of Chicago. Uh, I actually first met Casey in my first year uh, as a PhD student at Chicago where, uh, so this was in the 90s, he addressed our class wearing a uh, Beavis and Butthead tie. Um, he looks a little bit more uh, upscale tonight. Uh, his research covers capital and labor taxation, the gender wage gap, health economics, social security, voting, and the economics of aging. In addition, from 2018 through 2019, uh, Casey was the chief economist of President Trump's Council of Economic Advisors. And his recent book, You're Hired, which is on the shelf behind me there, uh, subtitled The Untold Successes and Failures of a Populist President, describes his experience in the White House and on the front lines of economic policy making. In addition to his academic research, uh, Casey has written widely on the discrepancies between economic analysis and conventional wisdom. His other books include Chicago Price Theory, uh, Side Effects and Complications, which is about the health system, uh, the redistribution recession, and Parental Priorities and Economic Inequality. He's also written numerous pieces for a number of popular outlets, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, and the New York Post, among many others. So we're very happy to have uh, Casey here tonight to discuss economic policy in the Trump administration. So Casey, I'll turn it over to you and uh, I believe you have some, uh, some slides to share. Good, well, I'm happy to join you guys. I wish we were in person. I have fond memories of participating in seminars at Wisconsin in the past. So hopefully that'll come again one of these days soon. But in the meanwhile, I'll show you a few things over the uh, screen sharing. Um, now, I, I take Trump pol economic policy in, in a few categories. Um, there's tax policy, of course, but it's bread and butter type of stuff, you know, stuff that Obama's people talked about doing. I guess until Trump proposed to do them, but they were talking about things like bringing the corporate rate into line with the rest of the world, um, limiting personal income tax deductions. So we wouldn't learn a lot if we spent time talking about that, not to trivialize it. Um, I'm gonna to try to focus on the parts maybe that you, you haven't heard of, heard much about, um, I'll tell you what I mean by 44 cleanup regulation. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard of it in the abstract, um, but I'm going to give you some more detail about on that. That's very important. 
but way under the radar. And I'll give you a perspective on trade policy. I know you've heard about the trade policy, but I'll give you a perspective on that. Immigration, also an important policy area. I don't have a lot on, on that, um, so I won't put a, much time into it, but um, really Trump's view of immigration was really, I, I was pretty surprised to hear him say this, but he, and, and as part of his speeches now, he says, uh, citizenship is the most precious thing America has to offer. I think that's how he says it. Um, but what he said in private is, that, you know, we, we should charge for that. And I'm like, yeah, that's Gary Becker's little book about, his short book about the uh, radical solution to immigration was exactly that, to have a fee um, for allocating citizenship. Now, he, he's a better politician than me, let me say that for sure. And he didn't go with that as his proposal, but he went with, we, we showed him all the different uh, systems that are, or most of the systems that are around the world. And he gravitated toward the Canadian and Australian systems that are point-based, which I view as kind of a centrally planned version of what Becker said, um, trying to guess with a point system, who are the types of people who would purchase citizenship if, if it were to, for sale, so to speak. So, let me uh, go into some of the stuff you haven't heard. So this is a picture of a Laffer curve with the tax rate versus tax uh, revenue. And historically, we've had a vigorous debate um, and a sincere debate, let me say, about whether feder various federal taxes, are they at point B, where raising the rate will increase revenue, or are we at point C, where raising the rate would reduce revenue? And one of the fears that I had in thinking about working for Trump, and for that matter, when I was discussing with the Bush people to work for the Bush people, one of the fears I had is, you know, I would find the economy at point B, but then the politicals are gonna push me to say, no, we're at point C. Um, and it turns out those fears were incredibly unfounded. I mean, unfounded beyond my wildest dreams, and I'm gonna explain that to you here. So to explain this, I'm gonna to need to zoom out of this picture. So you've seen the Laffer curve picture. Now, let me zoom out. Okay, so I've included the negative territory here. Um, so could you have a tax that actually costs the government money? Meaning, I'm not saying if you raise the rate, it'll cost the government money. I mean, eliminate the tax altogether and the government would save money. Um, and really economic history was made in the past 10 years by having two taxes like this. I had never heard anything like this before. Um, and this is something that we've had. And one of the two of these taxes, I think are the individual mandate from the Affordable Care Act and the employer mandate. Let me take the individual mandate. So I put it as point D here, meaning that if you got rid of the individual mandate, actually the government would have more revenue. Um, by having the individual mandate, the government actually has to pay for the privilege of having that tax. Um, when we were at CEA, that's what we estimated. We were actually the last in line here. Gruber had an early paper. He didn't say it with these words, but he had a group early paper. What if we got rid of the individual mandate and he showed how much more revenue the government would have. Um, and then the Congressional Budget Office found qualitatively similar thing. Not only that it's a negative territory, but it's like three, three X or something. So if the individual mandate, the static revenue from it is, is 40 billion, then you're losing over 100 billion by having it. That, that's how un, unbelievable that was. Um, of course, I understand the standard adverse selection justification for the individual mandate, but Let's remember that justification is always made in the model with no subsidies. And that's not our real world. Our real world has subsidies for individual health insurance, very generous subsidies. Um, and so what the individual mandate was doing is somebody would turn down a subsidized individual insurance. You would think they'd get a thank you note, but no, what the individual mandate did is gave them a punishment, a, a tax. And to avoid that punishment, people were accepting government assistance that they did not want uh, by revealed preference. 
So that's, that's kind of what I call the 44 cleanup, trying to get rid of those things. The employer mandate still stands. That would be one of the failures, I would say. Um, but the individual mandate is, is gone. The other part of this the unheard of part of Trump economic policy would be regulation. And there are, I wanna mention both the principles behind regulatory policy and the, uh, some of the results. Uh, one of the principles is a regulatory budget. And this is very natural people in budgets, if you're in charge of a business, you don't let your vice presidents, you don't just tell them go maximize profits I don't care how much it costs you. Um, you give them a budget, you say, go maximize profits within this budget. And if you can't, uh, if that budget's not enough for you, you know, come back with your hat in hand and explain to the boss why you need a bigger budget. Our country has never done that for regulation until 2017 and now we have that. Um, you've probably heard of the two for one, every regulation put in needs two coming out. That's a marketing gimmick, clever marketing gimmick. That's probably why you've heard of it. But the real meat of that is there's actually dollars. There's a dollar budget for how many, how many costs an agency can create with its new regulations um, in its quest to find you know, even bigger, bitter, bigger benefits. So the second kind of principled point behind this is a choice and competition. That's regulation should support choice and competition, not get in the way of it. Um, I think we did the best on articulating this principle in the health area. So there's a, if you Google choice and competition report, you'll see a report from Department of Health and Human Services, where we talked about all the ways that regulation uh, has been getting in the way of choice and competition and proposals for, you know, trying to clean that up. Uh, but these are principles that apply for labor markets and telecommunications markets and, and you name it. There's not such a clean principles document in those other areas, but these are certainly the principles that they've been trying to follow. And let me give you an example. This is from the health area. Um, this relates to the mar market for generic drugs. I'm gonna emphasize in generic drugs. So this is not a question, we got a new drug. We don't know how that chemical works on the human body. We gotta be careful. Drugs been around for, for so long that the patent's already expired. And the question is, who's allowed to manufacture that generic drug. And the FDA had a cumbersome system that some companies had gained and you had, they happened to be foreign companies for whatever that's worth. Uh, foreign companies had got themselves in the position where they were the only company making a particular generic drug. And so they were charging brand name prices for a generic product that they didn't invent. Um, and, uh, Part of the deregulation right away in early 2017 put in a FDA uh, director who was going to clean that up. You saw when that FDA director was appointed within a few weeks, I, I saw the stock crash of one of these foreign drug makers, Teva, uh, their stock crashed. And the analyst said, yeah, bad news. There's gonna be competition now in the US generic drug market. Um, soon, that was the first indicator we saw then we were seeing more approvals. The FDA was giving, every manufacturer still needs approval from the FDA. Um, and we're seeing more of those approvals being handed out. So you lower the entry barrier, you get more entry. Economics predicts that the data was showing it. The last thing that you would see, hope to see would be lower prices. Um, and that took more time. Um, first of all, there's a, a lag in getting the data. And then finally in early 2019, we were able to get the 2018 data on consumer prices. And that's my next uh, picture here. This is the consumer price index for all prescription drugs, generics and brand names together. Um, and it went down, I don't show you all, all of the data we have here, but it's the first time it went down in nominal terms in 46 years. Um, and this is something we were predicting at CEA before the data ever came out. Um, because we were using basic economics to say, well, you're promoting choice and competition. You're getting the entry. We can see that. We measured that already. You must be going to be, you better be ready for lower prices. And that's, that's what you got. Um, consumers saved a lot of money from that. Let me give you another example from fuel efficiency. 
uh, regulations around cars and pickups, trucks, fuel efficiency. Um, and this is one of these policies, you could call it a failure, you could call it a success, you could tell me in, in a minute here. You know, you'll see what I mean. So if, if those of you who aren't aware, the nationwide fleet of new cars, all the cars made uh, for American market, on average, they have to meet a minimum miles per gallon standard. Um, and presumably, the private costs of this standard are convex. So I'm going to draw an upward sloping marginal cost curve here. For each level of the standard, there's a marginal cost of making the standard a little bit tougher. Um, what do we know about this curve other than presumably it slopes up? We know a couple points on it. Um, there was a study of the model 2006 year um, cost, and it was pretty low because the standard was barely binding. That's when it was 25 miles to the gallon standard. Then about 10 years later, the standard was 36 miles to the gallon. And actually, and one of the things uh, we appreciate about the previous administration, they put in a market where the various manufacturers can trade with each other the right to relax their standard and in return for the other company tightening its standard because it's, it's really a nationwide standard. And, and the trades in that market were $116 um, in, in terms of if the, uh, for every vehicle that a manufacturer wanted the standard relaxed by one mile per gallon, they had to pay some other manufacturer $116. So naturally, we can figure out the cost. What is the cost of <coughs> um, raising the standard from what it was in the 2000s to into what it was in the 2010s? And that would be like the area E. Um, and that would be on a per car basis. Now, um, Obama's plan, when he, just before he left office, was to tighten the standard for still further. They announced these standards you know, ahead of time. Um, but what we see here is this standard was already costing $86 a ton per ton of GHG. $116 is equivalent on a ton basis to 86 bucks. Those of you who know about the social cost of carbon, the Obama people said the social cost of carbon was 50 bucks. So why are we paying 86 bucks for something that is only worth 50? Go figure. <laughs> There's somebody who doesn't want choice in competition. That's the real answer. And that is, the answer is the car companies. The car companies like being able to overcharge the consumer for environmental protection. So the president, uh, when he first got in, he said, we're going to freeze it at Obama. That's already too much, right? It's costing 86 bucks a ton, but we're not going to increase it anymore like Obama had planned. But let's keep it at 36 miles to the gallon. That's already too much. We'll keep it there. Um, and then right when I left, I saw this tweet come out and I'm like, uh-oh, what does he have to say? Well, he's bragging about his plan to freeze these standards at what, what they were when he came in office and not increase them like Obama said. And he said, yeah, they'll save consumers $3,000 a car. How foolish for the auto companies to want to do this. But I know the president, I know what this means. That means the auto companies came to him and they're saying, we want you to toughen that standard. And he's wondering, should he do it or not? How much will consumers appreciate? And I, I remember telling the chief of staff at the time, I said, he, the president's tweeting, that means is he, he's not going to go through with the freeze. He's going to increase the standard for, uh, because that's what the companies want. And that's what he did. He increased the standard somewhat. Now it's going to be, uh, it's headed toward 45 miles to the gallon. That's not as high as Obama was setting it. Um, so you could call that part of a success. The part I call a failure is that letter F here, that area F, that extra dollars per car, we're going to be paying, which don't have a commensurate environmental uh, benefit. Um, okay. Here's kind of a, a summary. I, I published this in the Wall Street Journal, kind of collecting together all our regulatory studies and asked, what do they cost consumers broken down by income decile? Um, the auto rules here is in the purple. That's consumer regulation. There's labor regulations. Um, energy regulations, in this article I focused on fracking ban, but in general energy regulations that go in the direction of almost completely eliminating fossil fuels will have this kind of incident. Um, and this is one of the things, you, you know, you don't hear about this at all. You, all you hear is, oh, Trump cut taxes for the rich. Well, he cut regulation for the poor. Um, 
And, and then Trump says that as much, but doesn't get repeated much. Okay, I will, to have more participation, I will skip this part. We can come back to it. Okay, tariffs. That's another trade policy is another part of what's going on. The president calls him, our current president calls himself a tariff man. Uh, Ronald Reagan, those of you who are old enough to remember, he didn't call himself a tariff man. Ronald Reagan gave great speeches about free trade and its virtues and how nasty the uh, anti-free traders are. Uh, I, I recommend you watch Reagan on YouTube. He does a great job talking about it. Um, problem is, it's all, uh, it's all talk and not a lot of action from Reagan. Reagan's a quota man. That's my, what I call him. He didn't call himself that. So he, this, and when I started learning, when I was there from Reagan people and reading about Reagan administration and, and its international trade policy, I was amazed at how the special interests are, are the same ones, the same unions, the same special interests are there seeking favors now who were seeking them from Reagan. And they got them from Reagan and they're getting them uh, from Trump. And they, I presume, got them from presidents in between. Steel, special interest there. Um, auto companies. Now, Reagan didn't do a tariff on autos, um, but he did a quota for, on autos, on Japanese imports. Um, and I list here in this table uh, other products where maybe Trump was doing a tariff and Reagan was doing a quota. Now, what's the difference? Well, one difference is the revenue. The quota revenue went to the Japanese companies. In fact, the Reagan people tell me that the Japanese companies would come to the Reagan White House and say, please give us a quota, and Reagan would give it to them. Um, whereas the tariff revenue goes to the treasury. So that's different. Now, because you're bringing money to the treasury now, where in the old days you were giving it to the foreign companies, Reagan did not have a trade war problem. I never heard of the Reagan trade war because I don't think there was one because the Japanese companies were very happy with this. They didn't want to fight back. Whereas uh, today, the opponent, if you want to call it that, is, is, is uh, China. And the Chinese do want to fight back um, because we're not doing the quota system for them. Here is another international trade policy. Um, it's a quota, a quota of zero. And um, it, uh, coastal shipping services. Every president in my lifetime and, and my father's lifetime have promised the unions, it's quite a small union by now, that they will not budge on this quota. They will continue to prohibit any use of foreign crew or uh, foreign ships in coastal shipping. Um, Trump is the first president not to promise that to the unions. Um, and the reason I have this picture, this is an infamous, I remember this is the lowest morale day when I was there, July 16th, 2018. This was the day when there was a press conference with Putin and the president didn't say politically correct things and didn't deal with Putin in a politically correct way and he got pilloried over that. But the real news in this conference, and that's why I show the reporters raising their hand, the real news was uh, some of the reporters asked Trump why is the New England consuming Russian natural gas? Why are they doing that? <laughs> we've, we've been complaining that the Western Europeans were consuming Russian natural gas, but the New Englanders in the United States of America are consuming Russian natural gas. And why is it? Because there's a prohibition on coastal shipping services. It's actually more expensive. Remember I said choice and competition? It's much more expensive to ship things from the Gulf of Mexico or from Florida up the East Coast than it is to bring it all the way across the ocean. And that's been going on, like I said, my, for a hundred years. And there's all kind of perversities that have gone on here. And President Trump tried, made some noises about poking some holes in that quota and allowing some imports. And Congress just ran him over. <laughs> and he would, did not want to fight them on that yet. Um, and then I would put that in terms of one of the failures. This was a chance to drain the swamp to promote choice and competition by getting rid of a regulation. And he hasn't done it, uh, let me say, yet. Uh, but he certainly hasn't done it. So those are the kinds of things that I see going on with Trump economic policy. OK, great. Thanks a lot. I, uh, I see we've got some questions coming in already. We'll, we'll get to those uh, in just a second. And again, I encourage people to, uh, to type their, theirs in. I wanted to. Um, ask a couple follow-up uh, questions are actually 
a little bit was to delve into the part that you skipped over there, uh, which in reading your book, I think was one of the more uh, interesting parts. A lot of people talk about regulation, um, but I think the general understanding of regulation is perhaps a little bit limited. It's a little bit more difficult to quantify. And when people do tend to quantify it, they think about you know time burdens or amount of paperwork. Um, I know that you've you know worked on trying to go beyond that. Um, so I wondered if you could talk a little bit. Uh, and again, I think this was the part you skipped over, but uh, I was particularly interested in, in that bit, thinking about quantifying you know, what are really the distortions that uh, regulations cause. Yeah, um, I'm glad we left time for questions because I want to deal with the things that are interesting to you guys, and that's that's good. So, you know, one of the things that I had begged. Uh, people in the White House, could we just not touch environmental regulation? Because one of the myths about regulation that it's all about the environment. Um, and anytime you see a story in the New York Times about Trump's deregulation, there's a picture of a smokestack. But that is a small chunk. And that's why it's urging them, let's just make it a zero chunk. It is a small chunk of what we're doing. Most of what we're doing is like the Jones Act, or, you know, like the prescription drugs, or like the, the autos, even the autos, is not an environmental issue really. As I, as I explained, we were already at the point of costing more than we're getting environmental benefit. The real argument between the Obama and Trump people on this is philosophical. You know, can we trust consumers to do what's in their private interest? Because we already know we've gone far enough in terms of the public externality piece of it, the Bagubian part. Um, and, and the Obama people, they took the stance that consumers can't be trusted to purchase their own car. So very little re regulations environmental. If, if there's, you're only allowed to think about one type of regulation. I understand we only have finite capacity. I would think about health, um, especially in the COVID era, but even before the COVID area, there are all kinds of regulation on the business of doing healthcare. Though that would be much more common type of regulation in terms of generating costs, maybe in terms of generating benefits, um, the number of rules that come across, however you wanna measure it, that's a big deal. Um, another big, big uh, regulatory area, I would say, would be uh, business to business price controls. Net neutrality is that. So these aren't price controls like, oh, the consumer is going to get gouged with too high a price. No, these are like business to business. Guys are just in the business. They're supposed to be smart at what they're doing. And we're regulating how they can charge each other. A lot of the health industry uh, regulations are business to business price controls. You know, and so how do you calculate, you know, the cost of that? Now, some cases we're lucky and we have, there are markets for compliance. And that's what we did with the autos. Um, there are some, I'd say too few regulations that have a safety valve where the companies can pay a fine instead of comply. I really think more regulations should have the Safety valve, um, that, that's another way uh, that it can be done. The way, so that's kind of how it ought to be done. How is it actually done? All they do is they count paperwork costs, partly because the legal part of it, there's the Paperwork Reduction Act that requires them to do extra reporting to Congress about the paperwork costs. So a lot of these regulations that would, I think an example I gave in my paper uh, with McLaughlin was, the stay at home orders, those aren't federal, those are state but, or, or local. But how would they value, uh, count the costs of a stay at home order? They would say, how, how many pages is it? How long does it take a family to read the, stay, the order that tells them they can't go to work, they can't go to school, they can't go to a restaurant, they can't go on vacation? If it takes them an hour and their time is worth 20 bucks an hour, then that's a $20 cost. That's, I'm serious, that's how most regulation is, its costs are assessed. Um, it's a joke. There's no concept of opportunity cost, which in the COVID area, I, I hope we all understand opportunity cost now. The cost of the stay at home order is not the time it takes to read it. It's all the opportunities that you can't pursue because uh, that's there. Um, and that's, that was a battle what we were fighting a lot, trying to get these agencies to recognize opportunity costs. The environmental agencies do recognize them, but again, that's a minority. Um, but the, the health department, you know, and you name it, the department, if it's not environmental, they don't 
recognize any kind of opportunity cost uh, to, to regulations. Okay, well, so going along with, I guess, the interest in environmental, we've actually had a number of questions on, on the chat already about uh, environmental regulation. Um, I've got my colleagues, Kim uh, Rule and Simeon are on here. Um, I don't know if one of them wants to take one of those questions, and then we'll get back to some other issues as well. Sure, I'll, uh, I'll try to summarize um, what, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of interest in the, in the chat room about maybe basically taking two tacks. One wanted to know to what extent your discussion about uh, transportation efficiency and, uh, and, and uh, uh, miles per gallon caps or floors, I guess, uh, to what extent they were taking into account uh, the environmental impact of these things. And then also the, the idea that it's not just, you know, environmental in a small sense, but in the sense of global climate change and large and possibly uh, irreversible uh, changes to you know, so what was the white how, you know, kind of what was the thinking on that and uh, um, and maybe how was that sort of considered in, in all of these uh, questions okay well there's there was my thinking and there's the agency thinking which were definitely different in process although we got to a similar conclusion so if you read what the agencies do it, that's a joint rule APA and uh, Department of Transportation they have a 1500 page cost benefit analysis and they get in all the details of how do you make mufflers and how do you make transmissions and go into gory detail. Mine is one page and I showed it to you. <laughs> There's a market for compliance. And it's, it's done per ton of carbon dioxide. So what does a car one corporate company pay another for the right to sell a car that will emit one more ton of carbon dioxide. And the answer is before the regulations got more strict, 86 bucks a ton. Okay, so somebody asked, well, how do I consider environmental? Well, there was a whole Obama multi-agency task force to determine what's the environmental cost of a ton of carbon dioxide. And they came up with 50 bucks or 42 bucks or something like that. So did I consider it? Yeah, I can do arithmetic. I can say, why are we paying $86? for something that the Obama people said was only worth $50 to the environment. Why? <laughs> and not to mention we made the regulations stricter. So what used to cost 86 bucks is maybe costing 150 bucks now. Um, so that, that's the, that was the intention of the Obama interagency task force. You can argue with whether you should be doing that and there's some good arguments, but their purpose to put that $50 number out, out there was to compare that benefit of carbon abatement with any costs of carbon abatement. Um, and so that, that's how I did it. Now, I wasn't allowed to actually say this. What I'm telling you today about the $86, they did not allow me to publish because the car companies don't want, remember the car companies want these regulations to be strict. And as soon as they got wind of the fact that I was coming up with a one page demonstration that our regulations are too strict, they got it squashed. So to this day, this uh, people in the White House are not allowed to say what I just told you, but I don't work there anymore, so. Great, uh, can I follow up a tiny bit with that also? Yeah. So uh, in terms of broader regulation, you said you wished that we kind of didn't talk about environmental regulation at all. Does that suggest there are no regulations out there that are worth $50 a ton or whatever it is that, 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 you, that you mentioned, um, or just that uh, I just didn't think it was politically feasible or, or what? No, I meant environmental de deregulation. Deregulation, sorry, yeah, deregulation, sorry. Trump has been doing deregulation and, you know, just, you just look at the portfolio, what is the value created by the cost saved or the net benefits of getting rid of all these regulations, these marginal regulations, right? We have tons of regulations that were here before Obama was ever here, right? So, but the, let me call them the marginal regulations, the ones that came in and were taken out, the whole value of that portfolio is only a small chunk of his environmental. And so I thought just for marketing purposes, it's like, if you just had none of it be environmental, then they'd have to actually talk about the real problem, which was stifling choice and competition. Instead of hiding behind, and this is the special interest love to hide behind the environmental protection. That they want you to think that all regulation is making the water cleaner and the air cleaner. And meanwhile, they're just taking money from the consumer. Exhibit, one uh, of 200 would be, you know, the procedures for generic drugs, making generic drugs. 
got nothing to do with clean air and water. It's got to do with a couple of companies well connected want to make money hand over fist by blocking entry. So you mentioned um, health as one of the main main uh, sort of sources of regulation, and I thought there was. Uh, you know, a lot of people have a sense that health is not sort of amenable to market forces. I mean, I think you, you showed one example there with uh, with prescription drugs uh, showing just the opposite, that it's a, it's a good like anything else. Uh, one of the interesting stories that I thought in your book was about the, uh, the sort of the side effects, if you like, of um, or which led to the rise in the opioid crisis. So, so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and how uh, maybe some unintended consequences played a role there. Yeah, now this is another way the area where there's a single policy area where I think there are both successes and failures in the Trump administration. Um, there's an opioid epidemic in the sense that the fraction of our population that dies by overdosing on opioid drugs um, is quadruple or something what it normally is. And, and the US overdose rate was already kind of high in an international standard before getting to this. So this is called the opioid epidemic. Um, why did that happen? Well, people consume more opioids, if I may beg the question. Um, now, why did people consume more opioids? There's a lot of theorizing on this, but the thing that nobody talked about is, well, what's going on with the price? Our basic Chicago's training right now is, when you talk about quantity of something, you gotta talk about the price too. And maybe multiple prices if there are distortions in the market, like a tax or something like that. Um, and so that's what we did. We say, oh, the opioid epidemic by definition is about the quantity of opioids. What about the price? What's going on with that? And we found that the price of opioids had fallen like a rock mainly due to subsidies. Um, prescri on the prescription side, the price of opioids had fallen like a rock um, due to subsidies. A lot of those subsidies were coming from Medicare Part D, which is a Republican program, which is one reason there's a, not a lot of interest in the Trump administration to, to look too closely at that, to, to say the least. Um, Obamacare has not, got another set of subsidies for, let me say, the opioid lifestyle. Um, so you had opioids getting cheaper by prescriptions, cheaper by a factor of five. What's the elasticity of demand for opioids? You, you, you tell me, but don't tell me zero. Um, I don't think that's going to get empirical support. But you can imagine that cutting by a factor of five wouldn't be surprising. You'd maybe double the quantity you consume, something like that, um, which is more or less in line with what happened. Now, the other opioid area, um, is illicitly manufactured opioids. So fentanyl and heroin usually mixed together. That's another area where the price dropped like a rock during a later period. You know, why did it drop so much? I think part of it is certainly coincident with it. If you look at say monthly data was that uh, Obama and Eric Holder as attorney general decided that they didn't want to fight the war on drugs anymore. Um, and they'll tell you that federal prisons, when they got there, were filled with drug offenders, and they reversed that. At, the federal prison population went up 30-something years in a row, they will tell you, and they went down every year after they started that. Um, and when they, that federal prison population started going down, perhaps as a coincidence, the price of heroin came down too. Um, and so heroin was getting cheaper. And actually there's an interesting, I don't wanna to go too far afield, but when somebody switches from prescription to heroin, that also is like a price cut because heroin is much cheaper than prescriptions per high or per morphine equivalent is the way the doctors would say it. Um, and the federal government has done very little to even acknowledge these changes. They've done a few things and that's where the successes would be. Uh, President Trump got rid of one of the subsidies, the subsidies for doctors for pre prescribing opioids. And the health department fought him to the very end. Even if you read in the Federal Register when they put out the, the new regulations around that subsidy, they're protesting the whole way. 
They're saying, we don't see a reason to do this, but the president told us, so we're getting ready. We're no longer going to subsidize doctors for prescribing opioids. Um, and then the Obama policy of not prosecuting drug offenders, at least on paper, Jeff Sessions ended that. Um, I still think there are a lot of US attorneys that are more doing it Obama's way. Um, and maybe that's all right. I'm not saying that we should fight the war on drugs. I'm just saying if you stop fighting the war on drugs, drugs will get cheaper and people will consume more of them. <laughs> that, that's the economist in me talking. And if we can't have that conversation, then I don't see how we could possibly understand uh, what's going on. No, it's great. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to get back into some of the questions from the chat. As you might expect, we're getting a couple uh, hot button areas in immigration and trade. Uh, questions are coming in. So I think we'll start with uh, one on uh, immigration. I think Simeon, uh, if you want to come. Yeah, up. so one of the questions in immigration was, you know, how much headway did the administration actually make towards something like a point system, like the Australian and Canadian model? Is there something in the pipeline? Was this ever seriously considered? Or is this kind of something that's just too uh, too touchy of a topic to to have made any headway? You know, I don't know how you measure serious. Everybody knows that Pelosi's not going to do anything with Trump on on immigration. So when Trump puts out a detailed plan for immigration, is that serious or not? Knowing that it'll never become law, <laughs> or or at least, you know, maybe it's sitting there for one day when. Paul Ryan's the speaker again. I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know if to call it serious. I mean, the president gave it a lot of attention. Stephen Miller and Kevin Hassett, uh, Rick Spurkhauser, they worked together on this. Uh, Jared Kushner. It had the top minds on it, but we all knew it was not going to become law in, in this term. Um, and But he, he, it is the official policy. He had a Rose Garden ceremony. I don't know if the media paid much attention to it. I went to it. I was paying attention. I, I didn't really read the newspapers that week to see. Maybe you hadn't heard of that, that he did that. Um, certainly, he doesn't call it the Canadian and Australian system the way I just did. Um, he has a nice name for it, the Make America Great Again Immigration Plan or something like that. But it's, it's a point system. Um, trying to remember his exact phrase that he uses to describe it, you know, economic criteria or uh, immigration that promotes our economy or something. That's his description of the points. Okay, so I guess so, it was, no, oh, no, sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay, I was gonna change the subject. So do you wanna follow up now or you're okay? Yeah, I wanted to follow up because there was a little bit, uh, a couple of the questions which kind of came in the chat was th there seemed to be a little bit of a conflict maybe between that point-based system and then we, restricting, say, student visas or the H-1B program. Uh, I wonder if you think those are intention, and uh, if so, you know, how do we think about uh, the source of that tension? It fits right in with the principles. Uh, I'd rather not talk about it on a recording. I'm, Fair uh, enough. That, that relates to an industry that I'm employed in. This is the cancel culture. Okay. So let's talk after the recording's turned off. Okay, fair enough. Uh, okay, um, so let's uh, turn the topic then to uh, to international trade. I think uh, you know most of the the you know students here would have learned at an econ class that tariffs typically aren't a good idea, particularly if you're thinking about long run uh, kind of ideas. What's the what's the motivation for for tariffs? You want to think about China, or you want to think about somebody else? That's fine. Uh, you know, what are what are tariffs fixing? Okay, standard economic logic. What's the alternative? Is tariff doing anything relative to free trade? That's one question. Maybe that's the question that's being asked. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You can frame it, it, it that way. Yeah. Or is tariff a good way to deliver protection? Taken as given that you're going to deliver protection. Reagan delivered it. Obama delivered it, they're all delivering it, okay? What's the least damage way to do it? And that may be tariffs, because that's kind of a point, I mean, a price-based way of doing it instead of a quota. Um, so tariffs look good on that metric. Relative free trade, not so good. 
you know, there are a few arguments that are, of course, in the textbook. You can look in Bhagwati's textbook, exceptions and stuff like that. Um, now, let me say, CEA, Kevin was running it and he was the boss and I was obedient and we were all obedient. His view was, we are free trade, no asterisks, no ifs, no buts. And so what I just said about tariffs being better than quotas, I, I never said that in the White House. I said that after I came out. We, I was mostly on domestic stuff, but we just said tariffs are going to have a cost. And if you didn't have the tariffs, you wouldn't have that cost. In fact, I, I guess I kind of piled onto that. I said, by the way, tariffs are on top of all the other taxes we have in this world, which are already pretty big. Um, the tariff, you know, a consumer gets, a worker gets taxed at, at, the, at work and then he gets taxed when he goes to buy the stuff and then he's gonna be taxed again when he buys international stuff. Um, this is taxes upon taxes upon taxes. And so actually my estimate of the damage of tariffs was bigger than really anybody else in Washington had for that reason. Um, and so that was really, also on immigration, by the way, we were always pro-immigration at CEA as a matter of principle, um, no ifs, no ifs and buts. And so when these things about student visas came up, we vigorously fought back against that. Whether that's corrupt or not, you can ask because the students are our industry, but um, that's what- And to, just to follow up, do you think tariffs have provided protection? Do you think that, that uh, in that sense they've worked? You know, the car companies were, there were times it felt like they were fighting back against the tariffs. Uh, even though an auto tariff was kind of on the table, they didn't seem real eager for it. Um, now it's, it's a little bit hard for me to gauge. You know, did the tariffs help the makers of washing machines or steel? You know, probably a little bit. Um, Again, I'll go back to Reagan. In Reagan's day, the problem that a lot of you don't remember this or you weren't even alive, intellectual property protection was a issue then. There was the East Asian issue that Japan, Korea, Taiwan, they were not respecting our copyrights and that, those sort of intellectual properties. And Reagan threatened tariffs. He did a few tariffs, but he's mostly a quota man, as I said, but he threatened tariffs to try to get them into line. And it took him until his second term to get intellectual trade agreements that include intellectual property protection. So I see that as very parallel here, that that's part of the tariff approach. I'm not saying it's a good approach. I don't know. It's just very much parallels Reagan's approach. Probably not an accident because Trump's chief trade advisor, Lighthizer, was the number two trade advisor for Reagan. So, um, and there's a lot of Reagan people actually in the Trump administration. So I, I kind of see it in, in that perspective. Um, if in the end of the day, there's no trade agreement that gives us a higher level of intellectual property pr protection, then I'll say there's been a failure somewhere with the tariffs or the negotiations or whatever levers you were pulling didn't deliver the result um, that Reagan was able to get in, in his second term. So maybe you can just briefly follow up on that. So do you, do you think that kind of the measure of protection is going to be in part um, sort of a question of whether or not we make some gains in terms of uh, intellectual property outside the US and how it's protected? Or it, are there other things that matter? So for, I'm thinking, and this is actually a question that Anand brought up, what about agricultural exports? Are we, is there a prospect that by launching this trade war, markets for US agricultural products are going to open up? And, and would that be one, you know, a yardstick against which you sort of measure success in this, in this trade war? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, they did get some agreements on like on dairy, I think. This wasn't totally my area, so I'm, I'm going from more fuzzy part of my memories, but I believe they did get Canadians did start giving our, our dairy farmers a more level equal treatment. Um, I think, and I, I discussed this in the book, there are some really big tariffs or quotas 
out there that have been around forever and nobody in the Zoom would probably complain about them, but they've been around there forever. I mentioned the Jones Act. Uh, another one I'll say is the chicken tax. Why is it called chicken tax? Long story, it's got nothing to do with chicken. It's a 25% tariff on foreign made pickup trucks, which is the most common vehicle sold in the United States today. Maybe none of you drive one, but it is a very common vehicle. And it's my, made entirely in the United States or in Mexico. Mexico is considered part of the United States for, the, for this purpose. 25% tariff. And as a result, it's, it, it's so stringent that they get no revenue from it. If somebody were to cut one of those, because they're already at such a high level, the gains from that, I think, would exceed adding a lot of little tariffs in, in other places. Um, the costs are convex. Uh, that's one of the very general results from economics. Um, and Trump is the only one who's worked on either of those big ones. He hasn't succeeded on either, let me say. I said the Jones Act, the chicken tax, he's talked about cutting, at least for some countries, but he hasn't done it yet. Um, but if I would want to include that in the metric as well. What, you know, on the whole, what is the value we're getting from international trade? Counting everything, you know. All right, I want to change gears a little bit. I mean, I think you brought up a part of the issue in thinking about, um, you know, the CEA being pro-free trade as, uh, as part of, uh, you know, part of your commitment, I guess. Um, I mean, we had one question about whether there was any conflict between, you know, your role in the political process and your role as, uh, you know, an economist. Um, but then I also want to sort of speak a little bit more generally about your time in the White House. Uh, you know, certainly the the outside um, impression of the Trump White House is one of chaos and, uh, you know, the president tweeting at all hours. Um, how did that accord with uh, with your experience there? Yeah, no, it's not random. I was, as I mentioned, I was asked a couple times to join the Bush CEA and it didn't work out, partly because I was a little uneasy on how did my research fit with what the Bush administration's priorities were. That fit was much better uh, with Trump. So I never would have never gone there in the first place. If I'm not a random sample, I guess, so to speak. I mean, because like the things I said on FDA, this basic idea that choice and competition brings gains to consumers and, and makes the economic pie bitter, bigger. I mean, that's such an easy, easy lift for, for me. And it's not a conflict. And so really I found the opposite relationship. As I remember I started out by saying, oh, I was fearful that I would think we're on the B in the lava curve and they're gonna force me to say it's C. I found the opposite of like, guys, you got like an epic tax cleanup you're doing here and you're not even realizing that it's epic. You're understanding that you gotta get rid of the individual mandate but you don't understand how incredibly valuable this is. So the roles were very much reversed. You, you, get, you think of Trump as a guy who over brags everything, but his team was under bragging a lot of what he's doing, partly because they were so busy doing it. And a lot of the lawyers would say that to me and say, Casey, we'll keep score later. We're, we're just like doing our job and getting rid of regulations that block competition. And we'll figure out how awesome it is after the game is over. You know, um, and I understood that. but. The, that made for a, it was not a conflicting, conflict type of relationship, um, most of those. And I, and I mentioned some with the health department and uh, there are a few places where, where there, I, there were some budding of heads. But um, so I made a lot of good friends there. I enjoyed working there. It was not backstabbing, it was the opposite there. I really, really enjoyed working there. Um, and you know, I, I wouldn't be. I mean, I would able to support them and uh, help them appreciate their hard work. I mean, they do work hard. And a lot of them been there a lot longer than I was. Um, and it was it was a pleasure to say, you know, here's some of the benefits of, of what you're doing. And you've never heard that these benefits were there and anything about no one's going to tell you about that. You're not going to read the newspaper. But here here it is. Okay, and Trump and then, tweeting is great. I mean, <laughs> Trump is the best marketing guy I had. A lot of the tweets uh, came from us. I wrote some of those tweets. And, and they were called, they got just as many Pinocchios, in fact, more Pinocchios, the stuff that I wrote for the president than other stuff that, that, that other people wrote for the president. I mean, the more true it was, the more the Pinocchios it gets because they could, 
you know, the, the Washington Post does not want to admit for a second that prescription drug prices are going down because that pr president promised that. And of course, he's an incompetent idiot. So how could that possibly happen? The man must be the luckiest man alive. The things just happen on his watch that he said was going to happen. Um, so that I really enjoyed that. I mean, he's very much he, he's great at fighting those, those those battles. He would I would have a result. He would broadcast it to tens of millions of people and then fight the battle when people said it wasn't true. It was pretty cool. So one of the uh, signature economic policies, which I guess came in of the Trump administration, which I guess came in before your time was the, the TCJA. Um, one, com the tax cut, uh, the Trump tax cuts more broadly. Uh, one of the components there was that the tax cuts on the household side were temporary. And I mean, I kind of know why they did that politically, but there've been some questions in the chat about, you know, what's the rationale for a temporary tax cut? And is there one, or was this just a political, uh, do you think this was just a political issue? No, I don't think there's any rationale around, economic rationale around temporary. They're like, we need a stimulus that is the stimulus by definition temporary, maybe. But there was none of that. It was very bread and butter stuff that we use. I would actually help with some of that. Even I wasn't there yet, I helped. You might have seen the thing that the, the op-ed that I wrote in the Wall Street Journal about saying Summers, you know, Larry Summers, when I took your class, you said, this is how you analyze the corporate tax. And now you say, I can't do that. What gives that type, sort of thing? Um, it was very bread and butter stuff. This type of stuff I'd learn in Larry Summers class or I'm sure classes at Wisconsin about, um, you know, how taxes affect, uh, business taxes affect the composition of capital, the quantity of capital. And then that is a determinant of productivity and wages and all that stuff. I mean, it's, Kind of boring. That's why I didn't want to spend your time on it tonight, but it's not unimportant. <laughs> yeah. Well, well uh, speaking of not unimportant, I mean, we haven't really talked much about, uh, you know, the choice uh, the country's facing right now, but that does seem to be one of the distinctions. Uh, I know you've written some on the, the Biden tax plan or the Biden agenda more, more briefly, if you want to just take a couple of minutes to, to think about, uh, you know, what would be the distinctions and what would be some of the potential impact. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've read carefully the Biden uh, plan. Maybe that's my problem. <laughs> Maybe it's just a spirit and I shouldn't be reading it um, in any detail. But reading it in detail, you see that it's going to increase tax rates on capital. It's going to increase tax rates on labor, mainly through Obamacare. So Obamacare, as we know, or maybe as we discovered after we passed it, Obamacare has generous subsidies that are withheld on the basis of number one, whether you work, not your income, but whether you work. That's an implicit tax on work. It also withheld on the basis of your income, that's an implicit tax on income. And Biden's proposal is to make the Obamacare subsidies even more generous. So you're gonna increase those taxes on work. So you have more taxes on capital, more taxes on work. Um, and then the other thing that's gonna reduce productivity, at least as we usually measure it, so maybe if productivity included some environmental capital, that would be less true. Although we've discussed already how some of these environmental standards have gone too far, um, but, and he wants them to go farther. Um, so in the regulatory area, there's kind of two parts of the regulatory area. There's the environmental part, which I said earlier, environmental is a small thing. In Biden's discussion, it's not a small thing. Now, maybe that's part of the issue that it's, it's a hot thing to talk about. So he talks about it disproportionately with how much he's gonna do it. That would be consistent with the history, but he talks about it a lot. Environmental stuff is reducing productivity. So we're gonna have to, we can't use fossil fuels, which are a much cheaper way to generate a megawatt hour of electricity than you know, windmills or, or solar or whatever. At the same time that he wants to take away a lot of the ways that we make electricity, he wants to increase how much we use electricity because he wants all the cars to be electric. So that's like a double whammy that's gonna do wonders on productivity. Um, so you have it from a neoclassical growth model perspective, you're hitting it from all directions. You're putting a wedge on labor, putting a wedge on capital, and then you're reducing productivity, putting a wedge into production function. Um, that, that's really the comparison. I mean, the only exception to that would be the tariffs Officially, tariffs are not Trump's long-run policy, but let's say that it is. Tariffs do create a wedge on, 
uh, a labor type of wedge. It's like a sales tax. Um, maybe some of the tariffs are an investment good, so it's like an investment tax. And, and in, in the work that I've done, I kind of compare that, well, what's the magnitudes involved there? Um, and it's pretty small magnitudes on the scale that Biden is talking about. Um, you know, maybe it achieves great things in terms of equality or making us feel good. I guess we'll see. I mean, he, I'm sure he will get tens of millions of votes. So some people feel good about those things. Okay, good. So um, we're kind of running short on time. We've touched on a lot of important topics. I think we should end with what might possibly be the most important. Someone who describes themselves as a fan in the chat room uh, was discussing that, you know, you were an undergrad at Harvard, you lived in the Mather House. And this fan wants to know if you still own the maroon windbreaker that you used to wear every single day as an undergraduate. I probably do. It might, it might kind of fit. I had a period in life where it wouldn't fit, but it might kind of fit now. Um. All right. Well, <laughs> on that note, uh, I think we will wrap up the, so the fan was David Johnson, in case you, you didn't know, oh, who's wow. a lecturer now in, uh, in our department. One of, our, one of the great teachers, uh, uh, really in economics, and we're, we're fortunate to have him. Um, so we'll, we'll conclude the, the main part of the program. We're going to stop the recording. If people are interested in speaking more informally, uh, the plan